I'd like to welcome all of you, what a nice turnout we have tonight, to another in the series of uh, lectures presented uh, by the Calvert uh, Library, by the Bayside History Museum. Uh, we have with us uh, from the Bayside History Museum, Grace Mary Brady. Grace Mary, where are you? Thank, thank you, Grace Mary. Robin Fuslow, representing the library. Robin, nice to have you. And of course, you never forget to recognize the elected officials. So, <laughs> the Vice President of the uh, North Beach Council, Mike Benton. Mike, nice to have you. Uh, Mickey Hummel, also a council member. If it's audio-visual in Town Hall, Mickey makes it run. Okay. <laughs> and I see Gary Pendleton. Gary served yes. with me on for eight years on the Lecture on the series. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, Nathan Hunter. Nathan Hunter. Nathan Hunter. Irish. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and of course, from the Chesapeake Beach <laughs> Town Council, Pat Mahoney. Thanks for having me. Anybody else want to be recognized? <laughs> I hope this band-aid doesn't draw your attention. Right? What band-aid? That's the right answer. That's the right answer. I, I had to run in with a dermatologist, so. And it's not one of those, oh, well, you know, you should see the other guy. Uh, the other guy looks just fine. I took the key. Uh, tonight, we are very privileged uh, to have with us uh, Christopher Baker. Uh, Christopher uh, is a travel writer, photojournalist, who works a great deal for the National Geographic Society. And it was in that capacity that Mary and I met Christopher last May when we spent nine days in Cuba. And I was so impressed, not just with the island and with the, the whole excursion in general, but Christopher in, in particular is just a wealth of information uh, about the island of Cuba and other places for that matter. But I think Cuba is his love and uh, we're so thankful to, to have him here tonight. <coughs> Christopher lives in Southern California and flew in for this lecture tonight and is flying back to Southern California tomorrow. So we're real honored and privileged to have Christopher here. Um, I, I remember uh, when we left Cuba, uh, you know, going through there, you could probably sneak some things through. You know, this was a year ago. This was before the relaxing of any tensions, much less the opening of embassies, which uh, I think Christopher will probably speak to. But he said to the group, there's about 20 of us, wasn't it? Isn't that about the size? Yeah. Said, please, please don't try to sneak any rum or any Cuban cigars, you know, through customs. Because it doesn't reflect well on National Geographic Society. So anyway, when I read that you could now bring $100 worth of cigars, you know, back to the United States, I, and I called Christopher, I said, would you do me a favor, Christopher? <laughs> I'm sure he brought me $99 worth. <laughs> One of these cigars here in the United States sells for $42.50. In Cuba, it's $7.50. Oh anyway, thank you publicly, Christopher. Uh, since we were in Cuba a year ago, Christopher has led 12 National Geographic tours on the island of Cuba. Been doing it for several decades. Uh, he, he also leads motorcycle tours throughout Cuba. And in the April and May of this year, he led motorcycle tours throughout South Africa. Uh, from Cape Town. So he, he is a world traveler. That, that's really, I think that's all you do, isn't it? Take pictures and, turn, and, he, and he's got some books here for us. Uh, 
I was fascinated with Cuba. That's why we went there. And I, I, I suspect that some of you are too. And that's why you're here tonight. You're not going to be disappointed. You, this is going to be an education and a real enjoyable experience for you. So uh, he's going to do his presentation. There will be time for questions at the conclusion. So let's give a real rousing North Beach welcome to Christopher Baker. Let's see, I'm wired, so let's see if I need the mic or not. It sounds like I do not, so thank you. Uh, thank you for those very kind words, and uh, I think that uh, your mayor probably has connections with the White House, because he must have probably spoken with President Obama to get this timing, so absolutely <laughs> right on the nail. Um, I don't need to mention what happened yesterday. This is really a uh, seminal moment of re-establishment of diplomatic relations with Cuba, which were broken under the late term Eisenhower era and uh, formalized by Kennedy. So we really are on the cusp of a new relationship, and I'm not going to bore you with politics tonight. However, you cannot talk about Cuba without talking about politics, so there will be references to uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba as I really take you on a tour of the island. So I want to throw in a little bit of geography, a little bit of history, and this is really Cuba 101. I hope at the end of it you're going to be excited enough to say, I want to go there. I haven't thought about it. Some people have already said to me this evening that um, they're very, very interested in going, and I really appreciated those kind words, um, Mark. Knowing, reaffirming that you have such a positive time. Um, this is not me on the right with my friend Julio. Uh, but the reason I have this photograph, this is my friend Julio Munoz in Trinidad. Um, this photo has, is important for me for two reasons. The first reason is that the horse died 48 hours after I took the photograph. We didn't know it was going to have colic and died that evening. But it really says something to me about why I cherish Cuba so much. It is not because, coming from England, you could probably detect that voice. Growing up in a coal mining community, I was a good socialist as a youth. It's nothing to do with that. It's the fact that um, Cuba, Cubans are the most genteel, gracious, and generous people you ever meet in this world. And it um, doesn't matter what you think of the politics. You really bring that home with you when you're there. So. Uh, Yesterday, this seminal moment, and we may, we may wonder why has this happened at this moment in time. Well, firstly, from the Cuban perspective, as you're aware, they've had a benefactor in the Soviet Union for many, many years. And when the Soviets collapsed, then, um, in a sense, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela picked, uh, picked up the support. And now, Cuba is undoubtedly rather worried about what's going on in Venezuela and if they will lose all their oil and that kind of support. Uh, so that moment was right. But in terms of the U.S. perspective, uh, Latin American nations across the spectrum had been telling the USA uh, in no uncertain terms that the time was nigh to accept Cuba into the family of nations in the Americas. And in fact, this is taken at the summit of the Americas, Cumbre, Cumbre de las Americas, in, that happened in April in Panama. And Panama, as the host nation, told the USA that the USA would not attend unless Cuba was in attendance. And the very first invitation that the, the, the Panamanian president sent out was to Raul Castro. Panama is one of our strongest allies in the region. So that was a message that uh, our Cuba policy had been disarticulating our uh, international policy. And I'll say, in, probably in Q&A would be the best time to talk about US-Cuba policy as domestic politics. Right? We've got an election year coming up, so that's very relevant. But in terms of some of the changes that have happened recently, Mark alluded to the fact that there have been changes in terms of travel to Cuba. But you need to know straight up front, uh, there is still a travel ban on Cuba, and it is still the only nation in the world in which there is a travel ban for American citizens. That is because, although the Supreme Court has affirmed that the U.S. government may not restrict the rights of U.S. citizens for, to travel freely, uh, they, in, they use the Trading with the Enemy Act still in place, so you can't trade without a license with Cubans. And that travel <coughs> comes under Treasury Department regulations. What happened under Obama? is he does not have the power to end the travel ban, so it is still in place, but he liberalized it as much as he was able to do. 
which means that now anybody who falls within the 12 permissible categories, which is a journalist, religious traveler, people going for humanitarian reasons, etc., now no longer needs to ask permission of Uncle Sam. It's now essentially on an honor system. If you believe you fall within that category, you are pre-authorized to travel to Cuba. So it may surprise you that Mark and I flew on, and uh, Mary, of course, wasn't forget Mary, um, flew on American Airlines direct from Miami to Havana. These are not scheduled flights. There are still no scheduled flights. These are charter flights that are licensed by the US government to take any traveler within those 12 categories. It's made easier by the fact that the Cubans themselves uh, uh, make the visa process, process easy. And when you book through the charter operators that operate these flights, uh, then you get your visa. Now, Obama has uh, also, in April, permitted uh, four, gave licenses to four ferry companies that are intending to offer ferry service to Cuba. So things are really picking up here. But again, that will be for the 12 categories of individuals only. Um, other change recently, Airbnb, you probably know, announced that they now have 2,000 private room rentals in Cuba on this system. And now if you fall within those 12 categories, you can even book them online through cheaper, kayak, etc. Uh, and I said it's an honor system. All you do is check the box affirming that you are within one of these categories. The regulations have been designed so there can be virtually no legal oversight of them. That's fascinating. So, yes, it, it's open to abuse. But it also means that I may finally see some worthy royalty checks from my two latest books that just came out this year that are available on, on the table, and that will be my, I think, penultimate sales pitch. <laughs> um, so, the law, Uncle Sam says this is not allowed. This is tourism. That is not allowed, and specifically no written into the regulations, no travel for touristic or recreational purposes. So you're not supposed to be having a good time after you're there. Uh, Mark, wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> uh, but of course, this is being abused. The one category that everybody in this room is able to travel under Cuba uh, with, uh, and it is, has led to this huge expansion, is what's called people-to-people -people educational exchange activities. Until recently, an entity like National Geographic or the, motor, the motorcycle company that I do motorcycle tours for, Moto Discovery, needed to request permission of Treasury Department to get the license to take people on what are called people-to-people -people programs. The whole essence being that you're interacting with Cubans and in that process, theoretically, this is how it got through Congress, etc., uh, then we're spreading democracy. Well, if you want to spread <coughs> democracy, just lift the restrictions and let people flood Cuba. It's insane. But anyway, the good thing is that you see some people really do have a good time, but it does also get you into the field with the field hands. This is the only way that legally you're going to do it as an American citizen. So you can all sign up for these programs. So Mark already gave the game away. Um, about my motorcycling, I was going to say you're probably wondering what on earth is the BMW doing in a sugarcane field in Cuba? And that is because in 1996 uh, I shipped my BMW to Cuba and spent three months there. It resulted in two books. One of them is up on the back there, published by National Geographic, uh, Mimoto Fidel Motorcycling Through Castro's Cuba. But also, AB, yeah, can you move it along? I think my battery died. No. Maybe bring light, but nothing. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so, one of my dreams had always been to be motorcycle tours, and until the people to people license category was created in 2011 by President Obama, it was not really possible to think about it. And then, uh, 2011, this license category was issued, and we applied for license. We were denied by the Treasury Department because they said recreation is not permitted. Motorcycling is recreation. Well, I was determined, so I rewrote the application and made the argument that the motorcycle is merely a tool like a bus to get passengers 
from one people-to-people -people engagement to another. They bought it, they issued the license, and the result was motorcycle tours, which I now lead. Uh, most of my tours are actually with uh, National Geographic, uh, and now Cuba has become their top selling trip. So National Geographic Expeditions has a very thick catalog of trips around the world, and Cuba is their number one seller. So I hope some of you may contemplate joining that. Now what's been interesting is in January, as the regulations were relaxed, I guess these folks were all referring to their attorneys, and their attorneys were saying, there's no framework for oversight on this. That is why Backroads, whose original license application I wrote four years ago, and they were denied, we tried again, they got the license, and Treasury Department said, you may not do bicycling or hiking. That is the whole rationale of, bi of Backroads, if you know that company. So this year, they've just introduced biking and uh, hiking. And so you can see some of these people, I believe, are pushing beyond the limit of what is legally permissible. So we will see. Uh, so there's even scuba diving, but I would counsel against it for this very good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so um, enough on that. Um, every magazine, every second magazine in the States is, is focusing on Cuba right now. I'm getting requests all the time. And so the rush is already on. This year, American tourism in the first four months increased by uh, 40% for legal travel, people to people, and 60% for illegal travel. So the rush is on, and um, I don't know how I feel about this, because about 10 years ago, I was getting a tour of the Hotel Saratoga, which you see here. I, I, are you pushing that, or is it responding to me in, on a delay? We're going back and forth. <laughs> All right, so I'll push. If it doesn't work, I'll yeah. give you the, the sign. So I was uh, in this lobby with one of the executives just after this hotel had opened in Havana, and the elevator doors opened, and the naked man stepped out. <laughs> and he did have a towel on. Uh, but he walked through this bar, and he had, was trailing water behind him because he'd obviously been up on the rooftop swimming pool. And the executive and I were aghast, our jaws down by our knees as we watched him walk through the bar and down, it's like a mezzanine overlooking the lobby, down the marble staircase into the lobby where he was intercepted by the receptionist who said in broad English, sorry sir, we don't allow guests dressed like this in the lobby. And in the broadest American brogue, he returned with, yeah, I know. And I thought, oh my God. Is anybody familiar with um, Faulty Towers? The, the BBC America show, I thought, I'm watching a scene from Faulty Towers, or is this Cuba's future writ large when, when the travel restrictions are lifted? So, um, what are your impressions? The first impression, it's immediate you arrive in, in Havana, is that you have stepped back 50 years, 60 years. You've come back into a, a place probably unique in this world that truly has been pickled in aspic for political reasons. Uh, and so these American cars are everywhere. Um, not least because no other country in the world imported as many Cadillacs, and no city in, the, in America had as many Cadillacs as did Havana. Um, so everywhere you go, you are going to find that perhaps about one-fourth of the cars in Cuba are uh, pre-revolution. I have a, my coffee table book I did on the old car sitting on the table, so that is the last of the promotion. Um, um, and including many of the marks that disappeared from American roadways years ago. Who can tell me what it is? Uh, Edsel, yes. All right. So, no shortage of Edsel. And where on earth in the world could you possibly imagine taking a photograph like this? This is not a photograph taken in 1959. It's a photograph I took for this book just a few years ago. And you could take it tomorrow if I let you down to this place. Uh, we d I don't have time to go into the reasons why it is that way. It just is. And it's, of course, part and parcel of what makes uh, a trip to Cuba so magical. Uh, back up there. Okay. Um, the second immediate impression. <laughs> 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 hey, yeah, hang on. You hold off. Let's just see if I'm getting a response. 
Obviously, 1959, there's the revolution, and Cuba spins <coughs> off into Soviet orbit. Uh, and in terms of the American cast, what that meant was that, oh, awesome, thank you. So, um, what that meant, of course, is that no more American imports, uh, and no more imports of many products, period. But, so what you do as a traveler is you, you have traded, when you get on that plane in Miami, you trade <coughs> off the McDonald's and malls of Miami for something entirely different. Uh, you, the billboards uh, imploring you to buy, buy, buy are really replaced by these uh, uh, slogans, in essence, imploring revolutionary zeal. Uh, and they're everywhere. These figures, only one of them will be familiar to you, and that, of course, is Che Guevara in the center. Um, Fidel, of course, is there everywhere. Fidel Castro, you can't. Uh, miss him, and perhaps the most uh, even vulgar, I should say, and most prominent of the, the billboards you would see is this one, Patriotism or Death, Fatherland or Death. It went up in 1960 uh, and became the, the motif, if you will, of the revolution in terms of the anti-USA uh, relationship that evolved. So those billboards are still there. Because the one character that is most ubiquitous, and perhaps even more than Fidel, is a symbol of Cuba, is Che Guevara. <laughs> All right, we definitely got a problem, but um, Che Guevara was from where? Argentina. Not even, not even um, Cuban. What you may remember from that beautiful movie, Motorcycle Diaries, that he set out with Alberto Granado after he graduated as a doctor on a motorcycle journey, ended up in Mexico where he met Fidel and Raul, signed on for their rebel army, and came as a doctor and came to Cuba to, in, to, for the armed struggle, but proved himself one of Fidel's most capable military commanders. At the end of the revolution, he was given Cuban citizenship and became Minister of Banking, Finance and Industry. So time for a joke. Che himself apparently loved to tell this joke of how he got the job of Minister of Banking, Finance and Industry. So, as it's told, Fidel is apportioning all the ministerial positions. And uh, he asks for uh, an economist. Che puts his hand up. Fidel says, you'll be Minister of Banking, Finance and Industry. The end of the meeting, th does this sound familiar to you? At uh, the end of the meeting, every, all the ministerial posts are apportioned, and Shea then says to Fidel, Fidel, why did you make me Minister of Banking, Finance, and Industry? And uh, Fidel said, well, I asked for an economist. And Shea said, an economist? I thought you asked for a communist. <laughs> and that's very relevant, because Shea firmly believed in that you could build a society based on altruistic motivation. His goal was to do away with money. This is the Minister of Banking Finance who was going to do away with money. And it's kind of ironic because now he is the most marketable product in Cuba. You see him on everything from t-shirts to tea cups. In fact, speaking of that, it's rather remarkable where he shows up. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, it looks like I'm going to I'm going to give up on that and rely on you. <laughs> oh, right. So um, if you travel to Cuba now, now is the time. Not not least because the American rush is on, but also because this is the time to witness Cuba as it was and as it is clearly going to be. Because something profound is happening within Cuba that's not being given much play, and it is the whole rationale too for why Obama is, has been making these changes. And that is to support the nascent private enterprise that has been unleashed by Raul Castro. So, 2006, Fidel Castro, still alive, coming up for his 88th birthday next month, uh, was taken very seriously ill, barely recovered, and of course, the reins of power handed over to his younger brother, Raul Castro. Not much was known about him, he was the Minister of Defense, but he surprised everybody. He has proved, whilst he is hardline communist, he's also uh, a pragmatist and understands 
that, that uh, change is needed and they have to accept the fact that they have screwed up much of their economy. Um, by the way, I have no sympathy or no empathy whatsoever for any American who tell, or anybody, by the way, I shouldn't point, pick out Americans, who tells them, point out the failures of the Cuban economic system, which are obvious, uh, without uh, acknowledging that the whole purpose of the U.S. embargo was to destroy the U.S. economy. So we need to bear that in mind in analyzing the obvious failure of the communist system there. But um, anyway, so Raul, what Raul is intending to do now is uh, focus people's attention not on the embargo, but on the fact that they need to address the things that don't work properly in the system. And uh, he is wanting not least to move a quarter of the state employees, and of course, until recently, the state employed everybody in Cuba, uh, and sponsor private uh, enterprise. The state is actually sponsoring this private enterprise. So that includes simple things that nobody can get involved in manufacturing. It's all service industry, um, barbers, etc. My friend Lazaro, if you come on the National Geographic tour, I will take you to see Lazaro. You will hear his wonderful story. Get a chance maybe to even purchase some of that artwork. Um, or maybe if you own a beautiful uh, convertible car and you're a Cuban, you can hire an outfit for two tourists. And in one hour or two hours, earn as much as the average Cuban salary in a month. Okay? Uh, that right now has been rising significantly under Raul, but a few years ago it was $20 a month salary. Okay? Now it's probably up to around $40 as an average. You yeah? have to remember this too. Uh, Cubans do not have mortgages. They own their homes. They don't have a mortgage. They don't have health insurance, etc. So costs are relatively low. But nonetheless, it's essentially slave uh, labor salary base. Okay. Uh, and then there are perhaps the most numerous people in private enterprise are the people renting out private rooms. Um, and certainly when I'm in Cuba and not leading tours, that's where I am staying. Thank you. Um, and the big money now with foreign investment is going into restaurants, private restaurants. There is a culinary revolution going on in Cuba. It is world class. You will be surprised, those of you who are told that uh, you better take some snack bars with you because you're not going to be dining well in Cuba. That was the old Cuba. Uh, these days, with state support, National Geographic uses only two state restaurants in our hotel. We're dining in the very best private restaurants. Um, and so it, it's, except it's wonderful to watch what's going on. And much of this is with American money. Uh, Obama lifted the restriction period on the amount of money that a Cuban-American family can send to Cuba. And you, in this room, every individual here, can send $5,000 each quarter to anybody, any Cuban in Cuba involved in private enterprise. So what's happening is Cuban Americans are now, many of them are coming back to Miami, or they're funding uh, family members, and so you're seeing world-class restaurants, an investment of money that most Cubans obviously don't have. And so you're beginning to see something exciting you all know what happened after the collapse of the Soviet bloc, and what happened in Prague and Poland, etc. This is a possibility. I don't see a collapse, a change happening anytime soon, but this is points to the future. Uh, and then you have private nightclubs. Um, this could be South Beach. But this is what's emerging now in Havana. Uh, the reality for most Cubans, of course, is that um, most of them are struggling to get by. If you do not have money, access to money from family abroad, that usually means Miami, $3 billion last year. This year is expected to top $4 billion from Miami into Havana. Mostly family of the old white class that left, middle class, upper class, etc. Uh, if you don't have access to that, um, you're going to rely on the state to a large degree for a base salary and, of course, the rationing system. Every Cuban has the right to all the basics provided essentially free by the state. One thing that we do on the National Geographic program is I get you into one of these to teach you about this. I don't want you to be on a tour bus looking at Cuba through a window. I want you to experience reality face to face with Cubans coming into the store and getting their rations, etc. So this is a system Raul wants to do away with too. He wants to take it to a needs-based program, much like our food stamp program. But there's a lot of political uh, opposition to that happening. Of course, um, those Cubans 
that means virtually everybody who cannot rely on the state meeting all their needs, then they're turning to the private market. So we take it for granted. You have a problem with your faucet, you go down to a hardware and you buy a new faucet. If you're out of tomatoes or whatever, you just go down to the, the markets. This was not a reality until the mid early 90s. I started going to Cuba in 92, and uh, I write about the food shortages and the lack of, um, lack of access to so many products in my book. Um, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the government was forced to turn to private enterprise, and now under Raul, you're seeing a great liberalization in the farming sector. They have a long, long way to go. Uh, the state control is far too great in terms of the, the marketing systems, the distribution systems, etc. But it is changing, and food is, under Raul, I've seen products across the spectrum become much more widely available. Uh, including the millionaire garlic growers. So why do I call him a millionaire garlic grower? Because uh, when Fidel was forced to liberalize and permit private markets in the uh, early mid-90s, um, and then as the state began to recover e economically, and he, he didn't like the changes he'd done, he very famously in a public speech railed against millionaire garlic growers. So you're looking at one now. Uh, they banned them again, and so for many years, whilst you could go down the road of any Caribbean island and see people selling fruits and whatnot, you would never see that in Cuba until Raul came along. And Raul has said, this is ridiculous, this is ridiculous, this is ridiculous, um, lifting a lot of restrictions, and so now you see this great increase in the availability of food. Um, of course, the whole goal was ostensibly to create an equal society, uh, Raoul has turned to the statements about the goals of the revolution on its head too, and he's, he said that that is ridiculous. We'll never get to an equal society. That's impossible in this world. Uh, communism essentially is theory, is what he said. Um, we will reward everybody according to their inputs and their ability. So, these are the old homes uh, in what was called Beverly Hills before the revolution. It's now called Kubanikan. I, I'm sure you could probably imagine who lives here. Okay, this is the government elite. I went in this house. This is the head of Fidel Security, by the way. And so these were dished out to people who were high in the government, uh, loyalists, after the revolution. Um, and many, many, many Cubans, whilst I'm going to say the, a lot of positives about the revolution as I go on, uh, I want to be very fair. Uh, these, these are housing conditions for a great number of people. Uh, and one of the things that we do in the National Geographic program, you will see as I go along, is we go to a meeting, a neighborhood uh, committee, and I always ask for them to open their homes. And we actually go into homes like this at times. There's a broad spectrum of housing conditions in Cuba, and uh, it has to be said that uh, they've done marvelous things also in eradicating homelessness and uh, Haitian-style conditions. And one of the reasons that I'm, I'm segueing to this right now is the photograph that you just saw, I know that family fairly well, um, and they're a family that feels uh, somewhat warm towards the revolution, um, despite their very humble conditions. This may seem contradictory to, to us. We, we live in a very materialist-focused society. We don't understand that when you live in conditions like that, how could anybody support the system that uh, they live under. Well, that's because of what conditions were like before the revolution. Uh, and I'll get to that point a little further along. But what the state has done is everybody has guaranteed free health care. Your family visit once a month by a family doctor. It's free of charge, as are all the medical services, as is your university and all other education. Uh, getting into university is based, of course, on academic competition. But once you're in, the state picks up the tab. In fact, the state is picking up the tab for several thousand doctors every year from other countries, including the USA, um, by the way. Thank you. Um, and that is why you can't take for granted that Cubans, uh, let's say, don't buy into the Washington myth that all Cubans are opposed to the system that they're living under. That is not the case. Um, and that is why you've come across many, many homes like this. You can't see it very well. But what you have here is a portrait of Fidel. Che Guevara, and the third in the triumvirate who died shortly after the revolution, Camilo Sinfuegos. Countless houses across the country um, and countless families display genuine felt um, empathy, sympathy, whatever the word would be for the revolution, and the characters who put the Cuban communist revolution 
in place. Uh, now for Fidel, this was all, uh, there were two, two ambitions that he had after coming to power, and I'm getting, gonna give you the process of how that happened as I go along also. The first was of course to put in place the kind of socialist um, system that he dreamed of, which could only have been done having separated Cuba from the USA. And I'll get to that in due course too. And um, so once he'd done that for Fidel, who I met personally one-on-one -on -one in October 2003, and I got an instant measure of the man, the definition of ego, and having become, by uh, managing to sever relations between the USA and Cuba very shortly after the revolution, it was for him a big battle against the USA. And so it was the stage, the, the, the spotlight on the, the stage for him was all about the role of David to Goliath. And so he never lost an opportunity to portray the USA, uh, to demonize the USA. And so this is little Elian Gonzalez in the arms of Jose Marti, the national hero. Do you all remember little Elian Gonzalez? Picked out of the sea, right, when his mother's raft that, um, sank and uh, the Cuban-American relatives whose care he was put into would not give him back to his father in Cuba. Um, and the Clinton administration wanted to get Elian back to his dad in Cuba, and we couldn't do it because there was due legal process to go through. Well, of course, Fidel never lost that opportunity, and of course, he portrayed it as the Clinton administration, as the U.S. Embassy, as it will soon be, now the U.S. interest section in Havana, he portrayed the Clinton administration as trying to keep Elian. He didn't lose an opportunity. Um, and I was at one of the demonstrations that were happening outside the U.S. Embassy back there in 2000. Um, and these youths are shouting, give us back Elian, give us back Elian. And they said, where are you from? And I said, America. You know what they said? We love you! <laughs> <laughs> I could have retitled this show, Cuba, a Schizophrenic Society. <laughs> and there's always this yin and yang in Cuba, and not the least and in a sense most absurdly, but also most endearingly, the relationship that Cuba and Cubans have towards the USA and Americans is nothing but warm heartedness. Right? They love American values, they love so much of the American system, and as you walk down the street, I am going to guarantee it, as you walk down the street, any one of you, during a nine-day trip, or however long you're there, when you tell Cubans you're from America, they will welcome you into their homes, even as communists, right? They, they love, it. it's, it's just a, a non sequitur, but it's just a reality, one of the surreal aspects of Cuba. Um, and so this is the kind of stuff you saw under Fidel also. This is what welcomed you to Terminal 2, which was the terminal that all Americans and only Americans fly into in Havana. Spanish speakers, the embargo, okay, called a blockade, because it actually uh, the U.S. embargo does impact other companies outside uh, USA. The, the longest running genocide in history, that is what welcomed you as you left the airport. Under Raul, it's gone. Um, Raul has put an end to all that. But the saw cuts both ways. And under the last George Bush administration, your U.S. embassy, uh, defying uh, international diplomatic law, uh, the diplomats had smuggled in electronic gear and they created along this floor a Times Square-like ticket tape message of anti-Castro propaganda. That's why these, these flagpoles didn't exist within two days. I was in Havana at the time. Within two days of this nonsense going on, these went up to block it out, right? Um, and so I'll give you just two that I remember. One of them was, uh, you can imagine this running along here, uh, some drive uh, Mercedes, which is a reference to the government elite, some drive Ladas, but most Cubans hitchhike. But my favorite was the Happy New Year message because it could not spell the uh, tilde, which is the little squiggle above the N. So Happy New Year became Happy New Anus. <laughs> well, thank goodness if I haven't got rid of that nonsense straight away. Um, but having said that, we still have in place, it's funded um, to the tune of $23 million a year, uh, a program to destabilize the Cuban government. It's still in place despite what's going on under Obama. And Cuba is not letting down its guard. 
Uh, I can guarantee you that. Um, and so one, since the Bay of Pigs happened, which was the CIA-sponsored invasion, in 1961, they have always had in place the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. There is one in every block in the country. If you're in a village, every village has it. But one in every block. So perhaps in North Beach, you probably have 20 or 30 of these CDRs. And um, the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution has two functions. The first is, of course, to maintain vigilance against counter-revolutionaries. But more importantly these days, they do the very positive work that neighborhood groups do, making sure that the elderly are well cared for, that the kids are not being delinquents. Um, by the way, I would have seriously needed a neighborhood watch over me as a, as a youth, but off topic. Um, blood drives, getting people volunteering for blood drives, etc. We go to meet them. This is one of our National Geographic groups. Uh, we go and see how they function. Uh, you can't be in a society like that and not, not really do so because you really don't get a, a sense for um, the true Cuba unless you do things like this. Now, I'm sure that we're playing dominoes, and this is where I make sure you get into side, inside people's homes. And believe it or not, this is the number one. We always ask, have a questionnaire at the end of the trip. What are the highlights of the trip? This is number one. We have people crying. They engage with Cubans. Cuban may be a lot of communists takes you into their home, gives you something, says, you know, we may polit be political enemies, but we're human beings, not all that stuff, you know? And that's what real people-to-people -people en enrichment travel is all about. Okay. So, enough on the politics. What about the, the, the geography of the place? Well, how about this stretching for, let's say, 300 miles? You're familiar with Punta Cana and uh, Dominican Republic? This is child's play. Okay, I don't want to denigrate from the Canada. I've written two books on the Dominican Republic, and I love it. I took this photograph um, 15 years ago, 1996, actually, with the motorcycle, because this was my lunch coming ashore. Um, I had a choice of red snapper or lobster. There was no hotel in this, this key. This was Cayo Sabi now. I was staying in a thatch hut. There is still no hotel, but most of the keys, or many of the keys that run along the north shore of Cuba that Hemingway wrote about famously in Islands in the Spring are being developed for tourism. 80% of all the 3 million tourists who visited Cuba last year stay in the all-inclusive resorts on these islands, and they've only just begun, because these stretch for 300 miles, unbroken, essentially, white beaches, coral reef like this. They have the potential for 15 million plus visitors a year, and they'll pretty soon begin to overtake the Dominican Republic as the number one. So, uh, then there's the beautiful uh, jade colored valleys and emerald valleys, uh, em emerald mountains. This is Baracoa, 1511, founded the oldest city in Cuba, and therefore one of the oldest in the Americas. And my favorite spot of all is three, three hours west of Havana that we include on the, the motorcycle tour. By the way, if any motorcyclists want to sign up, almost all these places we do on the motorcycle tours. Uh, and the wonderful thing about this, this area is, of course, the dramatic formations, um, but also the fact that this is where the finest tobacco in the world is grown. So those cigars that Mark is hopefully going to really enjoy, maybe share with one or two of his favorite friends, this is where the tobacco comes from. Uh, and so on the motorcycle trip, I'll take you in there, for example, and I'll, you get to learn one-on-one -on -one how all about the process of growing tobacco, and then of course the process of rolling it. This is on, on the farm, the famous farm of uh, Alejandro Robaina, who was the unofficial official ambassador of cigars for Cuba for many years. Uh, but also there's the cigar factories in Havana, and it, really a trip to Cuba would not be complete unless you went into a cigar factory, saw the process at work, and, and were able to bring your cigars back. This lady here is um, reflective of one of the many fine traditions that Cuba has carried on since the revolution. Um, starting back in the 19th century when the cigar industry in Cuba was founded, the early privately owned cigar factories educated their workers and kept them you know, lively, uh, awake, by having readers who would read from novels. So the reason that the Monte Cristo cigar that Mark's going to smoke is called Monte Cristo is because the Count of Monte Cristo was one of the favorite novels to be read to the cigar workers. 
So, and the same with Romeo and Juliet. Can you imagine? You got Shakespeare. Let's hope you enjoyed Shakespeare. Um, and so they keep that tradition alive. It's an absolute fabulous experience. And then there's the colonial past. Um, everywhere you go in Cuba, you are going to find the expression of the mighty power of Spain for four centuries in these castles and convents and palaces, etc. Uh, here we're looking at the castle that dominates the harbor mouth in Santiago de Cuba at the eastern uh, point of the island. <coughs> Um, but my favorite place is the beautiful city of Trinidad in the central south area of Cuba. Um, and the reason I love this is one of about five UNESCO World Heritage cities in Cuba. And this one is the most perfectly preserved. There is not a single one building, I don't think, within the historic core. It was uh, one of the cities that grew up on the wealthy and based on sh the sugar industry of the 18th century. But then it lay uh, outside the realm of advancements and was really a forgotten city for years, a century, more than a century. And now, is, of course, the most, um, uh, most touristic in, in terms of uh, drawing in tourism, but the least touristic in terms of the changes that have happened there, with the exception of the fact that almost every single person in that city is now self-employed. They're either renting rooms, there are very few hotel rooms, so this is a place that certainly on the motorcycle tours we take you, we can stay with families, right? You will, if you reach a house with a family. And if they're not renting rooms, they're running their own private restaurants, or they've got art galleries, etc. And yet this is the setting. And so it is preserved by Cuba itself, the UNESCO. Um, no modern buildings, no cars, etc. It's all horses and donkeys and whatnot going through those streets. Um, speaking of colonial architecture, even Trinidad pales in comparison to old Havana. So when Havana was founded in 1514, it was quickly uh, was positioned to be the main single entrepot for all the accumulation of, rather, the accumulation of all the treasures in the Spanish Empire en route to Spain. So the, the gold, the emeralds, one of them came up through Colombia, Peru, from Cartagena to Havana. Mexican silver from Veracruz to Havana, etc. And so Havana grew vastly wealthy. Um, and uh, that is reflected in uh, a legacy of 900 buildings identified by UNESCO as uh, World Heritage buildings. Uh, the whole city center was uh, named UNESCO World Heritage Center in 82. Um, and whilst there's great dereliction in this area, 140 acres that were once within the city wall has been taken down. Nonetheless, the, the Cuban government has done a magnificent job in what is now a, in its third decade, a restoration process under a single entity that has turned uh, much of this area into a very, very lively zone. What you're seeing now is the first private restaurants and bars opening there. And anybody who's familiar with the, the total change that's happened in Cartagena, Colombia, in recent years, that's where we're getting it right now in Havana Vieja, an absolutely marvelous place. Um, and so in terms of this restoration, there is a, a system in place, the most important buildings become the most important museums. So this is the former Palace of the Revolution. This was the building that the dictator Batista lived in before. Well, no surprise, that is the Museum of the Revolution. Then second tier buildings like this old bank, these become hotels. This hotel, by the way, is dedicated to the Jewish community. That is because this quarter where it is, located in Old Havana, was on the edge of the former Jewish quarter of Old Havana. And so they honor the Jewish community. And it's called the Hotel Raquel and all the rooms are named after biblical figures. It even has the only kosher restaurant in Cuba. And then the third tier become anything, commercial, a boutique. Uh, United Colors of Benetton is right there on the main square, right next to this place, one of two brew pubs run by Austrian companies. So bit by bit, you're probably becoming a little surprised at the, the depth and breadth of the Cuba that you probably never thought about other than some great communist Caribbean island, right? Uh, no, it is a vivacious uh, and uh, incredible place. And uh, one of the things that uh, charms me so much about Old Havana 
is the uh, ubiquity of these old horses and carriages. Where on earth they found that number of hundreds of them, I do not know. But it speaks uh, again to this constant sense that you are in a time warp zone, something that only Hollywood could have dreamed of. And that really hits home when you see steam trains. Now, if, I, if you'd have come with me 10, 10 years ago, this would have been a very typical scene going down any road in Cuba because Cuba was all about sugar. And these trains were operating those fields since the revolution, before the revolution, and since they were never replaced. Until 10 years ago, Cuba had more operating steam trains in the world than any other country with the exception of China. Then what happened in about 2002, the Cuban state began to run down the sugarcane industry. So there are relatively few of these working the fields anymore. Uh, they're now museum pieces. They're not just being trashed, they're being rescued. And uh, right behind the Capitol building, which is the old Senate building in Havana, is the steam train graveyard where they're brought in quite a remarkable scene to see all these old rusting steam trains right behind what is a building that is copied on the Capitol in Washington, which happens to be two meters higher than Washington's. Uh, um, and you can't un really understand anything about contemporary Cuba, U.S. relations even, unless you understand the importance of sugar in Cuba's history. So this Cuba, I am, or rather sugar, I call like the bittersweet bondsman that was the cause of slavery, but also the cause of tethering Cuba to three imperial nations. The first, of course, was Spain. Um, so much sugar produced there that Cuba was the biggest sugar producer in the world by the 19th century, when it was still run by Spain. But then after that, the U.S., Right? Cuba was producing sugar for the U.S. with the U.S. Gar government guarantee of set prices and purchase. And after the revolution, of course, the <coughs> Soviet Union. So sugar is vitally important in the history of um, international relations for Cuba. But it's also to sugar that we owe the vast wealth, when Cuba was the largest sugar producer in the world, that as... Um, left us this incredible architectural legacy expressed here, for example, if this is the wedding palace one block from the hotel that we stay in in Havana. So, Cuba, wealthier than Spain, wealthier than its, its colonial master at the end of the 19th century, and so much pent-up desire for independence that the wars of independence were launched led by Jose Marti, who martyred himself in the first battle as an example. Um, but what happened? The Cuban Independence Army were on the verge of gaining independence. The USS Maine battleship explodes in Havana Harbor. Teddy Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, craving a war with Spain. That's what he got. We declare war. The, what we know it as the Spanish-American War. The Cubans know it as the Cuban-Spanish-American War. The end result, of course, Teddy Roosevelt. By the way, yes, he was on a horse, but there was no cavalry charge. So the victors write, rewrite the history books, but anyway, San Juan Hill, remember that? And the end result, that the Cuba was run by U.S. military administration for four years. The USA wrote Cuba's institution. We put in place a man of our choosing as president, and essentially, for the next five decades, we manipulated Cuba for uh, our own economic interests. This is the Capitol building I was mentioning. Um, and this was a period when Cuban economy, the Cuban economy re re recovered, revived, but was owned more than 50% by U.S. interests. And um, it was a period uh, when, again, sugar dominating the economy that led to the explosion in wealth um, that's reflected in both arts, Art Nouveau, Art Deco. This is the form of the Cardi headquarters, as viewed from our hotel we use the Nat Geo trips. I call it the Lego building for obvious reasons. Um, Art Deco really didn't come any much better than that. And of course then the, by the 50s you had the mobster era and the great epoch of modernism. Um, this is the Riviera Hotel and the interior is identical to how it was in 1958 when it was opened by mobster Mayor Lansky. 
We all remember that name, okay? So Mayor Lansky owned this hotel. He was on the books as a kitchen hand. But, and this is the hotel that he famously wrote, I cracked out when a few months later the revolution succeeds, the mafia is thrown out. So he lost his investment. Um, and so this is very important to understand this era of 1959. Why was there a revolution? Well, brutal dictator Fulgencio Batista had essentially done a deal with the United Fruit Company and the mob, and they, as a triumvirate, essentially ran Cuba. The USA may not have liked him, but to use one of those famous phrases, uh, he's, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Remember that? Right? So he was good for us. Okay? Um, but it was also the period of casinos and, and brothels and strip clubs and whatnot, and that's from 1959, 58 speaks for itself. Um, and so, uh, Havana may have been the wealthiest tropical city in the world at the time, as it was, but imagine the image that you have of Haiti, right? The poverty, etc. that was existed on a similar scale in Cuba of the time. So you had the wealthiest tropical city in the world, but World Bank statistics, 40% of urban dwellers and 60% of rural dwellers undernourished, okay? 20% illiteracy in the cities, 40% in the countryside. So there was a young lawyer called Fidel Castro whose goal was to, to change this, reform this, and he sat, stood for Congress in the election. Batista, who was already a dictator, wanted legitimacy. Batista uh, put himself up for president in the election. When it was obvious he would not win, he canceled the election. So this young lawyer, Fidel Castro, decided on plan B. Okay? Revolution. That is when he launched the revolution. And he launched it with an attack in 1953 on barracks, army barracks, in Santiago de Cuba. It was a suicidal attack. It failed dismally. Uh, almost all of the people who were captured were tortured to death within 48 hours. Raul, 23 years old, and Fidel, lucky to escape. But they were sentenced to 15 years in prison. This is their prison cell in an island off the main coast to Cuba. They were so popular amongst the Cuban populace, certainly Fidel was, he was the rising star in politics, incorruptible, etc., the man to which uh, was getting headline news at all time, and there was such popular pressure for Batista to free them, that that's exactly what he did. And so they, they were now marked men, they would not have survived under Batista, he would have had them assassinated. They left for Mexico, which is where they met Che, they all came back in the Grandma Vessel <coughs> to launch the um, struggle as it was called. This was Fidel's headquarters, way up there in the highest reaches of the Sierra Maestra Mountains in the furthest eastern part of the country. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine that from that place, with less than three years, Fidel had managed to overthrow Batista. Uh, but he, now, very quick, another piece of history you need to know. There was a democratic government put in place that did not include Fidel. We recognized it, U.S. recognized it on January the 4th. Uh, Fidel managed to usurp it. Um, you don't need all those details, but anyway. He usurped it and quickly began uh, his socialist program. There was no way at the zenith of the Cold War that the USA would have acknowledged and permitted a socialist revolution to succeed on its own doorstep, especially when it was allying itself with USA's principal Cold War enemy, right? So whether it had been the Bay of Pigs or some other formulation, there would have been an invasion. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, we had the CIA-sponsored invasion of Cuban-Americans come ashore. It failed dismally. But when I was there motorcycling in 96, um, one of my favorite moments during the whole trip was when I took a, a cut through the underbrush and managed to come across this bullet riddle a B-26 bomber. I'm pretty certain I was the first foreigner ever to see that. So I'm just going to break and give you a little reading from my book about motorcycling through Cuba as I arrive at the Bay of Pigs. The road ran south like a plumb line past endless miles of dark green sawgrass and reeds swaying in the wind. I arrived at Playa Larga, a small fishing village 
tucked into the head of the 20 kilometer long bay were 1,297 heavily armed CIA trained Cuban exiles had come ashore in April 1961 to establish a beachhead and incite a counter revolution that would topple the Castro regime. Concrete monuments lined the roadside. Each one marked the site where a member of the Cuban military, 161 in all, had fallen defending La Revolución during the three-day battle. I passed a youth camp, and through the corner of my eye caught the unflinching gaze of a young communist pioneer peering down from his watchtower. Further south came the cracks. The gravel road was strewn with crustaceans squashed flat by vehicles like giant M&Ms crushed underfoot. The black carapaces littered the path ahead, and my route was patterned in pointless dots. I dodged around them, avoiding the margins where the razor-sharp shards and pincers of partially crushed crabs stuck up like broken bottles. The air stank of fetid crappy. I passed my first live crab scurrying toward the sea, bright orange, a newborn. Then a large black crab with terrifying red pincers ran across my path the forerunner of the lethal invasion heading the other way. Suddenly, I was surrounded by a battalion of armored surly crustaceans that turned to snap at my tires. I slalomed between them as they rode in the, rose in the road with menacing claws held high. Then I hit one square on. <laughs> it sounded like bubble wrap exploding. Finally, I arrived at the climactic spot where socialism and capitalism had squared off. Cuban families and Canadian packaged tourists, slathered with suntan oil, splashed about in the shallows. My black leathers and boots must have looked absurd. I gave one of the Cubans my camera and asked him to snap a shot at me straddling the bike in front of a huge billboard reading, Bay of Pigs, the first rout of imperialism in Latin America. They added the word Yankee, by the way, since then. I say it's the first rout of Yankee imperialism. It was difficult with the sun beating down on a beach as silvery as mountain snow to imagine the blood and bullets that mingled with the sand of the surf here 35 years before. So um, this year I got back there on two wheels again and uh, we take people on motorcycle trips and National Geographic to the museum that is there and tells you the whole story from the Cuban perspective of the Bear Pigs fiasco and if you're lucky I might even give you time to dip your toes in the Caribbean Sea. <laughs> where they came ashore. Um, so those were the conditions that led to the revolution. And so Fidel set himself the goal of addressing the poverty, illiteracy, etc. One of those goals was to eradicate racism. It was a very racist society. It had been a race, racist society. But unlike the civil rights movement, Cuba went about it a different way. Top down, stroke of a pen, and then re-educating people. And um, it's probably been the most successful model of how to tackle race issues in the world. Uh, there's no doubt, it, statistically also, it is the, the world's, uh, certainly the Western Hemisphere's most uh, racially integrated by any which way you look at it, blocks separated by ethnicity, etc. So this is one of the great uh, success stories of the revolution. And now I'm waving my hands about it. You must be very confused. <laughs> Um, and one of the other things it's done in this equalization process, it has um, created a, a personality type that has definitely shifted. Um, and and this, so people are very, very happy in their skin. To the degree that when we go to the CDRs and I say in front of you, they don't know this is coming. I say, please, I want you community members to open your doors and welcome us in. I don't know who, don't care who it is, that's just happening. So it's not pre set up. There's none of this, oh, excuse me, whilst I go in and tidy up. You go in there and it's very humble conditions, typically, uh, as it is. They, they do not judge people on anything other than personality, the traits of their character, as it should be. Um, and also, obviously, they have learned how to have a good time in a non-materialistic society. They can teach us an awful lot about how to get by and have a smile on a dime. Um, so the, the pleasures are, of course, dominoes. They take them simply. Ice cream. Uh, by that definition, I am definitely a Cuban. Uh, baseball, right? Probably the world's best baseball players for the side. Um, and I mentioned delinquency earlier. Uh, I was the worst of, 
uh, youth delinquents. I, I can tell you, but you don't see it, period, in Cuba. What you see after school is kids going to the Casa de Hedras. There's a chess house in every community, by the way. Um, all the young girls, of course, taking pleasure in the 15th birthday uh, tradition, the quinceanera, which is still going on despite the revolution. Um, and that's one of the great joys in any of our programs, is engaging with children in their own context. Um, so we have a lot of cultural engagements with them. One of my favorites, one of the favorites of, of any of our group members, is when we go to one of the special schools uh, that train gifted <coughs> children to towards the musical profession. This is something I know intimately because my girlfriend uh, in Cuba, who she's now actually in Uruguay teaching violin for a year, came up through this system, is a teacher in one of these schools in Cuba. Um, and it's a tremendous joy to, to learn about the education system. And again, doing it on, on a dime. Um, I think, Mark, you remember this setting and uh, this school really needs some investment in infrastructure. But they have all the love and fabulous tuition that you could ever hope that for your children to have. Um, and speaking of music, that is, we'll, we'll close with the music and dance because there is no escaping it. It is in your, the DNA of Cubans. Uh, everywhere you go down the street, this is one of my shots on the street. This was not a setup. She wasn't performing for anybody. I guess this couple were practicing. <coughs> um, and this is what you come across everywhere in Cuba. Uh, it's just amazing how many people are musically gifted. This, and there's no restaurant or bar that you can go to without musical troops. Uh, and that reminds me of something that uh, Norman Mailer said to Kennedy when blaming him for the Bay of Fig Pigs fiasco. He said, wasn't there anybody in the White House to give you a lesson about the country? You, have you invaded Cuba without understanding its music? Uh, I, so, and again, talking about the, the state's involvement, you can't get away from it in Cuba. They have done a marvelous job in sponsoring the arts. Not least every community has what's called the Casa de la Cultura and the Casa de la Trova. Their purpose is to ensure that the uh, traditional music and dance forms are, are kept alive. And one of the marvelous things when you go to these places is that you might think, well, it's a generational thing. You'll see all the old people there and the young people at the disco. No, the young kids, will, you won't see old people at the disco, that's for sure. But you go to, the kids who are going to a disco are also going here. And this in, incredible interaction of Cubans of all ages on the cultural level is best reflected when I remember one moment in the Casa de la Trova in Trinidad, like a, probably an eight-year-old dragging out this beautiful 18-year-old girl to dance and they, they're dancing and everybody's appreciating it and she was not hurrying to get off the stage. Um, and the state has also taken high culture into the countryside. The National Ballet, the National Opera have got to go to perform in the countryside. And so in a state also where, you remember the days when there used to be just four or five channels on TV, right? I grew up in Northern England with three, three and then four channels. And we were all kind of watching the same stuff. These days we're all watching what you want to watch. Well, everybody in Cuba is watching the same stuff. There are five state channels and one Venezuelan channel. And so everybody gets, you might be a campesino, a customer, a peasant, poor peasant farmer, but I guarantee you you've got a TV. It was the first thing the state got into everybody's hands. And so everybody has, has access to high culture. It's quite a remarkable phenomenon. Uh, and then, of course, the world-class salsa. I don't need to say anything else about that. So uh, I'm going to end with, with uh, the cabarets. One of the quintessential cultural components of Cuba is the cabaret, the kind of Las Vegas style review. And they have a heritage going way back, well beyond 1939, which is when the most famous cabaret of all, the Tropicana, opened on New Year's Eve. It was closed down, as were all the cabarets, along with the strip clubs and brothels, live sex shows, etc., immediately after the revolution. But the cabarets were so close to the heart of Cubans, they actually demanded that they be reopened, and they got, they got them reopened. Uh, and so they've been running ever since. The Tropicana is quite a spectacle. Mark, did you go? You did? Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. Good, all right, great. And I'm gonna close with um, one of 
my favorite anecdotes. This was my girlfriend, Mercedes. I tell the story of this in the book. You get the fuller context. And she was my girlfriend for five years. And as you can see, she's a, a showgirl. And on the first date when I went to pick her up, uh, she had shaved her head. She was bald. Okay. She was wearing all white clothes, top to bottom. The only part of the flesh showing was her face and not even her hand. She had white gloves. And she had all these colorful beads and bangles. And I knew what this meant. She had just been initiated as a santera in a religious ceremony that includes animal sacrifice, a secret ceremony. Santera is a believer in the Santeria Afro-Cuban religion, which is far, far, far more popular than Catholicism. And I knew that she lived at this moment in a high state of grace, that she believed herself to be literally possessed by her orisha or religious deity, and that all Cubans would regard her as such, that I, that I couldn't touch her, uh, that nobody else could touch her, she couldn't be photographed, all these prescriptions that they go through for one year as they live in this state of grace. The belief in, for her, the reason she did it was um, she wanted to bring better luck into her life. Maybe that's why I stepped into it, just thought about it. <laughs> Uh, or it could be for any other reason, right? Um, you've had illnesses in the family, whatever. But we, we took this 1950s taxi into uh, Old Havana, Darkened Street. This was in the mid-90s when there was very little gasoline and it meant there, there were 16-hour blackouts every day, right? No electricity during the night. Um, and so the, the policeman jumped in front of the car and stopped it. And I could see in the gloom this man lying in what was clearly a pool of blood. The policeman was commandeering the taxi to take us, put the guy in and take him to the hospital. He hadn't seen Mercedes in the back seat. So she wound down the window and stuck her turbaned head out and said to him, you can't do that, I am Oya. And the policeman, black policeman, believer in Santeria, touched his beads and waved the taxi on and thrown back into the seat as the taxi driver hits the gas pedal. And I looked behind me to see the policeman running down the road to look for another car. I said to Mercedes, what on earth did you tell him? She said, I told him I was, oh yeah, Santa Teresa, the patron saint of the dead and the cemeteries. Had he put that man, injured man in the car, I might have killed him. This was my first date with this woman. Can you imagine the shiver on that? <laughs> That's why I call this Cuba land of eccentricity, I'll add eroticism, Thank you. I swear that was by far the quickest hour and a quarter I've ever had. You haven't touched on um, national parks or reserves or efforts to try to um, deal with ecology. Yeah, good question. It's a mixed bag. Um, we now include, this was not part of the, the tour last year, but we now include it. We moved with the head ranger at the largest national park, the Zapata, where the Bay of Pigs happened. We, we have a whole presentation on ecology. That is just National Geographic. So they do have a system, a national park system, very underfunded, and of course um, working on a, on a, uh, a threadbare budget. But nonetheless, they are keen on protecting what they have. They have not developed their potential in terms of income resources coming in from ecotourism, for example, Costa Rica being a perfect model. They have had Costa Ricans in to educate them on that. Uh, but they've not taken many of the bold steps that are needed to open up hiking trails and whatnot. Uh, partly, I think it might be reflective of the ingrained paranoia that they have about letting foreigners infiltrate beyond control of group entities, etc. I don't know, but they do have park system. They have 19 national parks, and the parks vary, but some of them do a, a fine job, and so every type of ecosystem that Cuba has is now protected. Oh! I understand that there's uh, several, or two, a couple of currencies that uh, we have to deal with. Yes, a good question, not least because they are expected to be eliminated by the end of the year. So Cubans get paid this $20 I told you about, that equivalent, they're paid in a national currency, which is the Cuban currency, it's the Cuban peso. 
But anything of any value that any Cuban wants to buy or a tourist traveler is purchasing is sold in a second currency. This is the Cook, convertible peso, right? So there are two currencies in parallel, but they vary in value, 24 to 1. And if you want to buy toilet paper or anything of great value as a Cuban, you're being paid in this, you need to get hold of this. So the big scramble, which means a lot of scams and whatnot, to get hold of this. But it is an economic nightmare to, for an economy, especially one that is increasingly integrated into the world system, right? Neither of these two currencies is convertible. So one of the big problems Cuba has had is that they have had to use US dollars coming in to the country to pay their international obligations. The Obama administration came down on the international banks. Biggest fine, eight billion dollars, a French bank last year, for trading US bills via Cuba. And it meant it closed down all the banks. No banks would trade with Cuba last year. Who stepped in? China and Putin. Brilliant international politics, right? But anyway, off topic. Uh, so they have said that this year they will uni be unifying the currency, and it will be the Cuban peso. So they're adjusting prices according to and experimenting. So, so, so what do Americans do now for currency? You have to change your dollars for the convertible peso. And they are banking. A private individual in Cuba will accept the U.S. dollars. They're now legal tender. But there's a 10% surcharge for U.S. dollars. You go in with Canadian dollars, euros, and U.S., you'll get 80, uh, 3% charge on the Canadian and Euro, and a 13% charge, which is 3% commission for the exchange and a 10% penalty if it's U.S. Oh, well, let's go. Um, what is Sunil Castro's official uh, job what's that Job? Okay. So what's the, uh, Fidel's official it's title? It's a two-parter because the current uh, leader is his brother. Right. Yeah. How does he um, reconcile the fact that his brother is obviously not on the forward thinking? Uh, this is an excellent question. So, um, there's a lot of speculation as to what Fidel feels about the reforms under Raul, and nothing is really known. The public stuff, the state controls the media there, so uh, you have to accept, take it with a grain of salt, or at face value, what they say about Fidel, which is that he supports Raul's reform process. I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. He's uh, had a different personality, but it really is irrelevant uh, in a sense in that uh, when Raul came to power, it was he made immediate statements about what his intentions for reform were. But all Fidel's men were still in power, and uh, Raul was essentially taken for ta to task frequently, not that publicly that way. But you could read between the lines that uh, Fidel's men were saying, "Hey, he ain't dead yet." And um, Raul had to very purposefully replace all Fidel's men with his own loyalists brought from the army. So it's the army that runs most of the economy. More than 50% of the Cuban economy is in the hands of the military. The military staff that was sent off to international business schools to run corporations. Okay? And they are now more than 50%, about 80% of the council of ministers. And so they are vested. So uh, one of the questions that I'm sure I'm probably going to preempt is, well, what does this change mean in the US? If we're going to see McDonald's and Microsoft in the US in Cuba, not anytime soon, even if the embargo was lifted, because not least, there are many considerations, not least, you have a vested body of people in the system as it is, the military figures who are running uh, these corporations, etc. <clears throat> you, you had your hand up for a while. The passion that Cubans have for baseball is probably second to none in the world. I think it's a fair statement. Um, is, is there any baseball incorporated in your in your specific boards? Um, yes and no. I say I say that because it will depend upon is there a game. What we do is we adjust our program according to you know, we read the, the mood of the clientele. We know that if there's a baseball game, there'll be requests. So we have frequently changed the program to have visits to the baseball. That photo was taken when I was with the National Geographic group. 
We've had training sessions with the, net, the team at Simfuegos, which is one of the professional teams. Um, and I've also on a motorcycle trip just done an impromptu stop when there was a game going on. It happened to be Sancti Spiritu, the once pro two provinces playing in a place you wouldn't even think was anything but kids knocking around at baseball. This was a national game going on. Uh, so it, it can happen. I cannot say it will, but it can. And there are a couple of companies doing baseball tours. Well. Mm -hmm. Two people. Can I add to that baseball? You can. I was in the Central Plaza in Havana, and the, uh, back in the 90s, and the, in the late 90s, and I was astounded at how the men were arguing about the different American baseball players. And they had their their RBIs, their they, all the statistics, and there were these men, and they were emotional and arguing for their player. And, and that and that place still exists. It's called Hot Corner. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. under the Marty oh, statue in Hot Corner. Hundred men, and they were all talking about American <laughs> baseball players. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for your. And it's very interesting for me to see how your perspective, you know, to see your perspective on the country. And my question is, if I can travel there as a tourist and do the recreation, because I have a Russian passport. And, uh, but how safe is it? What is the criminal situation? I would say it is, uh, without hesitation, the safest place in the Americas. Bama. Mm -hmm. Bama. Incredible. Yeah. And, and I don't need to answer it. That just said it all. Back on investments, um, you mentioned 3 million tourists in 2014. I'm kind of curious of who, who are the tourists, where are they coming from? Okay. Secondly, investments going in, uh, we have Latin American, European, Asian investments happening in China sure. right now? Sure. Okay, so in terms of tourism numbers, it's always been number one Canadians. Um, so they're about a third of international tourists. Americans are number two, but most Americans are not included in that list because it includes Cuban Americans and people on people to people. They're not included in the official Cuban statistics. But they're num number two is Americans. Number three may surprise you, English. And that is because Richard Branson's Virgin Airways flies daily from you know, the, the big planes in. Oh, yeah. uh, that came out of nowhere. Fifteen years ago, you never heard an English accent. Um, and then it's Germans, French, Spain, etc. But the big two are right now Canada and uh, the US. In terms of where the, the money is coming from for uh, major investment, right now Brazil is number probably number one. The only, essentially the only creditor right now is China. They stepped in to replace the vacuum created within the last two years. Uh, but Brazil is big. Uh, there is, as you know, probably the Panama Canal new locks are opening next year. These are the new giant locks for the giant ships. Well, Cuba is already building, is well advanced in building uh, a new port to handle those ships. Brazil is in there. China's building the electricity station, Russia is doing the jet dredging, and there are foreign corporations moving in because it's a free trade zone. Uh, and then there's, of course, money coming in from Spain, Germany, Canada. Most of the world trades with Cuba, uh, although the U.S. embargo does affect them, impinges upon them, and tries to restrict them. Given your uh, talk about your girlfriend, uh, that was a dancer, and her state of grace at the time, and, and uh, the difference in religions. The Pope is getting ready to take a trip there, and I understand there's a lot of excitement about that. Is that true? Is the country that you... It will be the third Pope in a decade. Uh, and re that reference to the Pope draws some, up something important that I didn't reference before, and that was religion. Before 1998 and John Paul's visit, there was heavy suppression of religious expression. Uh, I did not see the main cathedral open until after John Paul's visit. 
the doors door was closed. And John Paul asked for liberalization, and he got it. Not only did Christmas become an official holiday, but the church doors were opened up and they began to stop repressing people. So I would say these days, religiously, there's virtually no, if any, suppression in Cuba. Doesn't mean politically. <coughs> Um, so then you had three years ago, um, whoever the Pope was three years ago, Benedict, Benedict right? Yeah. Messed up one of my National Geographic trips trying to get across Havana when they closed all the roads. Um, and then yes, the, the Pope is coming. But very pertinently, this Pope was the conduit for the rapprochement that we are in right now. And he's Latin American. He's Latin American, of course. Okay. Yeah. And, and Cuba was a big, has been a big, big issue for Latin America in terms of U.S. relations. And they have put a lot of pressure on the U.S. All wrong subject. Um, are, are they burning any of the old Catholic churches over there? So oh, very much. Sure. As a church? Or Many of the Catholic churches have been restored in recent years. Uh, not least because they're integral to historic zones that have been declared as protected and in need of restoration. Um, and the state, of course, is funding most of those. Uh, post Castro, a few years from now, will there be in place or is there in place a state government uh, that will maintain the momentum uh, and keep the culture that they? Revolted against. Great question. And um, the second part would be will it be such a stable government that will preclude the reestablishment of the kind of uh, culture there was, uh, the casinos and the prostitution uh, that Castro was fighting? Um, well, firstly, I hope there's going to be a stable government. Okay. Um, and I wish. What I want to see, by the way, is that this model that Raoul is putting in place succeeds uh, and accelerates as a prelude to a multi-party system. But that multi-party system is way down the line, I think. Um, so yes, they are, there is in place a, the next government. We know who the next president will be. One of the Raoul's reforms was uh, as they are democratizing slowly the, their internal system, he's put in place, including for himself, term limits. Sorry, Mark, but two five-year terms. <laughs> um, and so he, he leaves in 2018. And so constitutionally, the first vice president, who is Miguel diaz Canel, not military figure, will take over. Now, to what degree will he be his own man? when so many of the Raoul's military figures are council of ministers, it's yet to be seen. Uh, where will U.S. relations be? Will the embargo have been lifted entirely? Because you have to understand, for the Cuban perspective, this is the, the existence of a U.S. embargo, a threat from that big giant trying to create a more democratic system that threatens their uh, own system, is to them uh, a cause for many of the um, a lack of human rights that we <coughs> identify as exist in Cuba. And so one of the Latin American perspectives has always been to the states, get off their back and they can ease up. You want them to ease up, then you have to get off their back because whilst the, the threat really exists, they can't and won't ease up. So I, I don't have a crystal ball, I cannot say, but in uh, what the future will look like. In terms of culture, um, it's already under threat. It's under threat from reggaeton, from rap, and from the internet. So we are, they, Cuba is now caught in the same complex dilemma that we have worked through in the States for better or worse over the last few decades. So internet saturation in Cuba is the least there is by far in the Americas, but it's, it's coming in. Um, and materialism is seeping into, I need an iPhone, I need an iPad just for the sake of having it, etc. What's happening as a result of that is there are other shifts in values that I am beginning to see uh, of it's the me society rather than the us society. All right? There's no perfect society in this world. We all know that. And we all, we are the product, each of us, of our own society we grew up in. 
I am English and I look at America somewhat differently in many ways than I think your average American would. And certainly I witness that from Cubans, the way they look at their own system. They bring to viewing Cuba through a Cuban value system, not an American value system. Which is not to say they don't want to be able to control their own lives. There's certainly a great lack of that in Cuba for the majority of people. Uh, but one of the components that they clearly do want to keep beyond the free health and education is their cultural integrity. And that is one of prob probably the single most important component that has been a result of the separation of the USA and Cuba politically, economically, and socially all these years. It is its own entity culturally. But it's probably a time is numbered. Is Papa Hemingway still held in high esteem down there? <laughs> um, there's been a lot of myths about how much esteem Hemingway has held it in Cuba. So uh, it's an interesting question because I'm very directly involved in Hemingway down there right now. I didn't know it. Yeah. Um, you all remember Starsky and Hutch? Yeah. Okay, so I'm partnered with David Soul. We are restoring Hemingway's car. Uh, we have unique access to it to make a documentary on it, which Mark is aware of, has seen the, the video. Um, and we are supplying all the parts yeah, and making the, this, this happen. The reason it's happening is that the car disappeared. Nobody knew where the car was. It was only discovered in 2011. And I had the great fortune to be the first person to see it, and photograph it, and report it. But anyway, um, so but in terms of your question, Hemingway is not th that esteemed by Cubans to the degree that is presented by anyway fans, for example. Um, so yeah, the Cubans are very familiar with Hemingway. It's not like they're all reading Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> I, I believe his, his work, some of, having said that, I need to take it back because the, the one I'm reading in the cigar factory I was reading Old Man in the Sea for my <laughs> we, put, we put that book in our hands to do the film for Baby and Son. Now, he is treasured by the Cuban state, not least who understand the, the economic value. I don't want to take away from them any sincere appreciation for Hemingway. But at the same time, they understand that they've got an economic, economic value. So where was Hemingway's principal home in this world? It wasn't Key West. He didn't even own that. It wasn't Sun Valley, it was Havana. That was his home. To the degree that when US Ambassador Philip Bunsell showed up his house on two occasions after the revolution and said, we think it would be a good idea if you demonstrated where your loyalties lie by leaving Cuba. And he said, literally, he said, go to hell. <laughs> that was his word, go to hell. This is my home. And of course, Philip Bunsell came back a short while later and said, well, J. Hector Hoover is investigating. <laughs> we really think it would be wise. Because he got the same response. Uh, and his, his son, Patrick, had said that having to choose, because he, in the end, he had no option. Because he left for health reasons, but he would have been kicked down anyway, as all, all Americans. Then Patrick said that um, the fact that he had to choose between his home, which was Cuba, and his homeland, was one of the major contributing factors to the depression that caused his suicide. Well, I sat next to him in La Florida. You did? Yes. Want to tell him? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a bronze bust. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, had a, he had a favorite seat at the bar uh, in La Florida near the Central Park. Well, you, know, I don't tell you. you actually saw it. You couldn't see it. <laughs> um, well, can we back up? It's not that fun. Back up one more. Back up. Oh, keep going. Okay. I forgot. This is not this. I have set shows I give to national. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. The drumming? Yeah, there it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Leaning against the bar. <laughs> yes. I'd like to say that the mayor has a favorite seat at my restaurant, but there will never be a bronze. <laughs> I must think you work at a deal. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably the 
probably because he doesn't have one of Hemingway's traits that led to his infamy that gets you a seat like this. And that is, anybody who was sitting in that seat when he entered that bar, you had one opportunity to get out. Otherwise, you were being picked up. Oh, well, that works at my place, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he had that bronze for one cigar. So. <laughs> uh, in, in the quest of of uh, U.S.-Cuban normalization relations of, of, between the two countries. And, and looking at the post-1961 nationalization of U.S. private and probably public uh, companies and the, re the issue of restitution, where are we on that issue right now? Because that, I, I, we hear a lot coming out of a place about 45 miles from here. Sure. About, about the, 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 this has to be done. You've got sure, to get sure. it. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, written into U.S. law uh, is the fact that there has to be compensation paid. Now, Cuba has never denied that because international law states that any government that expropriates foreign uh, entity property needs to compensate. They have acknowledged that, and to that degree, therefore, they have settled all compensation claims with all countries except the USA. They have said that they are willing to do it. However, I think it's going to end up being a wash because Cuba has, has within international court system a claim for God knows how many billions was of dollar, dollars of damage because of the US embargo. Uh, and so when December 17th last year, the very first hint, the announcement contemporaneous in Havana and Washington by Obama and Castro that the new rapprochement was on track, that was happening. At that moment, arriving in Washington was, of course, Alan Gross and the CIA agent who we never knew about, I never knew about him, 21 years in prison, traded off for the three remaining Cuban spies. I think there's going to be something similar, okay? Um, not least because in the, what's called the Helmsburg Law, which is the U.S. embargo, the Cuban-Americans who have claims also need to be compensated until they are, the embargo can't be lifted. Well, Cuba will not pay many of them. Hmm. They will say, probably in many cases, correctly, well, they, they were corrupt, they were disturbed, etc. Et so it's uh, to be unresolved, or to be resolved, but it's not a simple case of just Cuba paying up with the embargo. Well, yeah. Sir, sir, can, can you tell us who the, today's Cuban is, uh, his ancestry, the, the nationalities and races that mixed together? To, so there is no one person. I mean, uh, Cuban is not uh, you know, just one right. nationality. No, no political philosophy, etc. It's um, right. no so so you know, so Cuba obviously is made up of uh, a combination of Spanish and African heritage with a few Europeans, etc. Thrown in. One of the reasons that I like to show the cabaret slide, and I, I give three presentations on my National Geographic show, so I usually know what's coming up and what's to be said in the context of that show. I kind of merged some shows tonight, so I didn't get to say it, but when we have the cabaret dancer up, I like to refer to how iconic she is within the Cuban mentality. One of the reasons the Cubans demanded the cabarets to come back is not just the showgirls that they like, etc., and salsa music. It's that they see themselves on stage in the sense of the iconic mulatta the mixed blood Spanish and African represents their own identity. Uh, and this was beautifully expressed uh, by a mulatto poet laureate, Saint Nicolas Guillen of Cuba, who identified that Cuba, of course, is the, was the result after independence when he was trying to establish it, a unique own identity. It wasn't Spanish, it wasn't African, it was no longer not a colony of the states. Um, what was it? And uh, it was this unity of Spanish. African principally represented by the mulatto, the iconic mulatto dancer. Didn't express that necessarily very well, but um, those are the two key components in the physical entity of what it means to be Cuban. And then, of course, you had a lot of American blood in there, 
uh, and all the European settlers who came in during the colonial period and post. Very little Russian blood, um, some. Uh, and then there's a beautiful, absolutely stunning Russian Orthodox church opened in Havana, paid for by the Russian embassy uh, about six years ago. And of course you go in there and it's put babushkas in there, you know that you can see the Russian blood in their faces. I just have one question on uh, Guantanamo. Why does the um, Cuban uh, relationship with Guantanamo and what's going to happen there? Good. Couldn't go home until that question, but that's <laughs> um, Guantanamo, this is a fascinating story how we get Guantanamo because I can't answer it until I, I address that one. Guantanamo we gifted to ourselves as an amendment to the Cuban Constitution. When Washington wrote the Cuban Constitution, um, we forgot about Guantanamo. So it was what was called the Platt Amendment, right? And um, so we, we give it, gave it to ourselves on an indefinite lease or until both signatories, Cuba and the USA, agreed to end the lease. Cuba, since post-revolution, has never accepted that as a legal document, right? It was dictated as it was by Washington. Um, and so, because it's an indefinite lease, political reasons in Washington, Obama wants, probably wants to close it. Pentagon has said it has no e military value to us anymore. But of course, it's a political hot potato. Uh, and that's why we still keep it. Uh, now, Fidel had said that if we hand Guantanamo Naval Base back, 47 square miles, um, then he will turn it into an international hospital facility, which you probably won't know if you don't. I don't know. International what? I'm sorry. Hospital. Oh, hospital. Medical facility. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But right now, of course, we've got the, I think we're down to 50 odd people, uh, Taliban, etc., in Camp Delta, which is one little quarter of Guantanamo Naval Base. And that's part of the, uh, even Raul has said that, that that's part of the Normalization. Right. Process. Full normalization. Yeah. 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 But are the Cubans getting any uh, anything out of their Guantanamo being there or any kind of face to face stuff? Uh, yes, absolutely. No longer, but I would say under Fidel, absolutely. Fidel always stoked the anti US boiler. Mm -hmm. And having Guantanamo as a military base served his that purpose. Fully, because it was a slap in the face of nationalistic pride. Nationalism was the one tool that all Cubans could respond to. By the way, when the Bay of Pigs happened, it was only during the Bay of Pigs invasion that for the first time Fidel ever used the word socialist to identify the revolution, which therefore made it acceptable to a people on the verge of national invasion by a foreign entity. Very clever. Because the Cubans have to be prepared for socialism in, in their mentality. They weren't, they didn't fight for that when they overthrew Batista. But there's still, uh, what you say, a love of the Americans. Oh, Is absolutely. Because uh, they drive around in their old cars. Well, <laughs> that, that helps. It's not because they drive around in their old cars. Believe me, any, any Cuban would trade you tomorrow for um, one of your cars. That is for sure. Um, and they drive those old cars because they don't have any other choice, right? Uh, but nonetheless, yes, it does. No, they, they understand American values. They love Americans for American personality. Uh, there is this bond of affection that goes back to, you have to understand how America shaped 20th century Cuba. Cuban middle class were living and desiring the American dream. It's a wonderful book by Luis Perez on this entire thing. That they were looking for their modernist 50s home with the new 50s car in the driveway, the TV. What did they watch? What was the favorite program Cubans watched? I Love Lucy. Lucy. I love Lucy. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> it was. Um, and so the, the, this sense of affinity with baseball, etc. Babe Ruth playing in Cuba, the, the baseball teams practicing before they ever went to Dominican Republic. It was Cuba. Right? So there are many, many bonds, and that has never died. The revolution has not killed that. And that's one of the fascinating aspects of, of going there. 
When we go to the CDRs, I have no doubt that the CDRs are selected for us, right? Because there are CDRs that I know where the people in the committee go, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm not naive uh, about about that. But that's an important to me. It's an important component for me to take people to Cuba to experience a revolutionary rah 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 CDR. That is part of what Cuba identity is, right? And, and you can gauge for yourself to what degree does it come from their heart, and how much is it propaganda, etc. Uh, that's not for me to tell you. That's for you to make up your, your own minds. But uh, I can't remember how I got to that. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe last question. Now you've got soap operas to go off. Awesome. Uh, maybe. <laughs> All right. And so the question: Fidel and Raúl grew up. It's not a question. That was a statement. Maybe a question. That wasn't the question. Oh, that wasn't the question. How oh, right. They, you said how right. How did they yeah. end up going um, almost in two different directions? And the second question is, how has how the Cuban people been able to take our 50, 60 year old cars living on an island and keep them running? Uh, well, you have to buy the book and see all you. I, I told Mark to close the doors until all the books were sold, but. Um, <laughs> So the question, in case you didn't hear it, a very interesting question. Um, Fidel and Raul grew up in the same household, was the question, and how did they grow apart, if I understood that correctly? Okay, um, well, whether they grew up in the same household or not is actually questionable. Um, this is the kind of thing I would close the doors in Cuba to say, uh, but there is firstly speculation that Raul is fathered by a Chinese laborer, and there seems to be enough evidence to suggest that is true. We do know, but no Cubans know, that their mother was the housemaid in the house of their father and his wife. So they were fathered illegitimately, which means it's meaningless in Cuba, right? <laughs> the vast majority of people are born out of wedlock, right? Marriage, marriage in Cuba essentially means common, well, marriage, right? Um, but what is important is, of course, the Cubans are not told in that context. All you see is photos of the mother as wife of the husband she later married after he divorced his wife. So their upbringing is unknown, and that's the way Fidel and Raul have kept it. And there's a book by the former CIA stock Cuba analyst, Brian Schlatel. Um, two books he's produced, and the first he goes into that history called uh, After Fidel. Um, and suggest, you know, brings up enough evidence to suggest this very important fact that they were probably brought up in a hut outside the household of their father. Their father was the wealthiest man for miles around the rural patriarch. So they got a somewhat privileged upbringing, especially after they were formally acknowledged when he divorced his wife and married the housemaid. But what's interesting to me more, just because I like scandal and scuttlebutt, is was Raoul fathered by a Chinese laborer who is named by name by Louis Bardak in another book called Without Fidel. Okay. Okay. I didn't answer the second part of that question. Cars. So how you have to buy them. That is too long a question. But the cars, my my uh, father's Cuban. And my uncle was in uh, a political prison and he was in the gay, uh, Bay of Pigs invasion. So he was in prison for 18 years. But the cars, my grandmother would get in touch with my father, which was very difficult back in, in the days. And he would go to, we lived in Ohio at the time, and he would go to Canada and send parts to the students. Well, so think he left in 79. She took uh, a raft or something. Oh my God. Well, um, I, I do tell that full story in the book over there. It's a coffee table book. But to answer the question, mm -hmm. they keep them going with great ingenuity. The good news is that they are getting better and better year by year because in the past few years, Obama lifted the many restrictions on what could be sent to Cuba and Raul lifted restrictions on what could be brought in. So what you're seeing for the first time is wheel car paints, 
spray guns and real car parts. Now only probably 50% of those cars are running on original motors, less than that. My friend Luisa, did we take you to Luisa's house with the harness? Okay, so he met Luis Enrique. He has a 1953 Buick. That took out the 500 horsepower engine and put in a 90 horsepower boat engine uh, with the largest steering, with the Mercedes brakes, the Kia transmission. We call it the Savage. And that's the way most Cuban cars are. But they are also now national heritage. Many of the best ones left the island between 93, 4, and 5 when the Cuban state was so hard up for money. They were selling them to foreigners. And then there was so much corruption in it that they ended the program. And then at the same time, they were able to declare the national heritage because they realized, oh, tourists are coming in. They like it. So they can't leave. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, I've been going 20 odd years. And I thought by now I'd be seeing less and less. I, I remember hearing this story when I was there. Most of these cars uh, had tires that have inner tubes in them because they're so old. Of course, that's not the case anymore. So it's hard to get these inner tubes. Uh, like, probably hard to get them in this country. But So when they had flat tires, they stuffed the tire with straw or old clothes or anything like that just to make it round. So it can continue to roll. My, my last point, uh, Mark, you may remember that when Luis showed you, he, he has 13 pre revolutionary Harley Davidsons. And they couldn't get tires. Remember, motorcycle tires are round. They had to use car tires. And they end, he ended up, one of the Harleys, getting a wheel from a Volkswagen Beetle and welding and, and rejigging it because the only tires available in Cuba were 16 inch that would only fit that. So one of the Harleys runs on a Volkswagen wheel. <laughs> Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, Chris Neighbor does have some books. I'm sure he'd be happy to sign them for you. Uh, this has been just like a good job to experience. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your Thank you all for giving me time tonight, so I appreciate it.